just grab an instructional video. Hold it tight. Hey, Chad, look, it's you. Way. Wow. Yeah, some people can get really, really angry. Really fast. Maybe five minutes later. <laughs> 12 seconds later. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, 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 my God. Help, Chad, help me. Boy Meets World. Wait, no, this is this isn't Boy Meets World. What the heck is it? Oh, oh, it's a fresh faced kid, you know, with glasses saying hello that to us. That is a man. That is a man. Scott the Manziac. Scott the Mans. Yeah, Scott the Mans. Okay, so the W's up. It's upside down, and that O is actually an A. Yeah, Scott the Mans. Yeah, Scott the Mans. Mans. Yeah. We are he is the man. So Scott the Waz, uh this was recommended on our Discord by the way. Uh Game Boy when Boy Met Game. So I know a little bit of the history of you know of the Game Boy, you know. I it came out before I was born, mm -hmm. but I still played one. That's the thing. It, it, it its last ability is probably its most defining feature. I mean, you know, kids had the Atari Lynx, the Game Gear. Heck, I got a Game Gear. My parents got me a Game Gear for super cheap. Uh, they bought it with, I think it was seven games, and I got that. And it was like Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Mortal Kombat. It was awesome. But it kept running out of energy. And then I kept going back to my Game Boy. And I was just like, I, I, this, I could play this for hours. And it was an addictive gameplay loop. I mean, you had... Uh, the Super Mario Land, which was a pretty much Super Mario, uh, Super Mario on Game Boy, and then you had a, oh, yeah. uh, you had a um, Donkey Tetris. Kong Country Donkey Kong. was pretty much just a port. It was, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was great. That was amazing to me. Oh yeah, the fact they were able to pull uh, that Zelda. off. Zelda. Oh yeah, dude, Link to the you or know, you know, Link's Awakening. There was. Uh, um, there were there were several. Doctor Mario. Yeah, dude. Um, <laughs> I mean, Mortal Kombat. Yes. Um, there were a bunch uh, of Street games. Fighter. There was, I mean, pretty much one to one, just without the color, to a lot of stuff on the Super on Nintendo. the green dot matrix screen. Yeah, uh, and you rarely saw the uh, like like me. I remember when the battery ran out on that thing. I had the same batteries in it for months and months, right. and I played it on average, you know, several hours a day. Yeah, and it never ran out of juice. I mean, I burned through batteries like crazy but i was always getting the cheap ass ones from the dollar store yeah those non-name brand ones like the me my parents always got uh the panasonic ones mm -hmm. or the rayovac yeah the rayovac because they were cheaper than like the energizers and the duracells and they lasted just and as long let me correct myself before i get drug i know that it wasn't a one-to-one -one, even without the color graphics it would just, or gameplay it just felt like it when you were it a kid really it didn't felt really like matter you were still playing well, a lot of games were, you know, shit in comparison to the uh, six or the SNES version that they just ported to the Game Boy. Oh yeah. But like some of them were really good. Donkey Kong Country was really fucking good. I remember. I yeah. liked the Mortal Kombat and uh, Street Fighter ports. I mean, there was a bunch of shit that I really, really, and this was in comparison to what early on it was like what those little two button handheld consoles that barely had dots that resembled anything but a blip on a radar yeah like, they had ones that's like oh this thing has over 200 games on it it's got tic tac toe snake uh draw the line uh, you, know, you know just you know it had like but like, learning games like a math like a math thing or it like was a spelling game ahead of any other option, in oh, my dude. opinion, for anything port portable and back then. Nintendo having the spearhead at that point on the mobile, they never really gave that up. No, they still to this day are jamming. Like, I mean, the closest was the PSP, and the Vita could have very well been the Switch before the Switch. It could have, but, but Sony got greedy, had fucked up memory cards for it, everything was overpriced, and then they just didn't support it. And again, man, it's just it, <clears throat> what could have been. Yeah. What could have been. But Nintendo pretty much has had a foothold on the handheld market since the Game Boy yeah. and never gave it up. No. And now the Switch is here. And the Switch is basically 
the unifying thing for handheld and console gaming that I think a lot of people wanted. Its graphics are good. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're not like like ray tracing or anything like that, what we have now with uh, modern PCs and modern gaming consoles. But still, the fact that it's able to put, uh, you know, put stuff out there in HD. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this, there's some games that just do not need to be ported. For instance, WWE. And you I, know, I, I, I re-downloaded it just to mess with it to see what would happen. And I think that there have been updates and it is a little bit better. I still don't think it's playable. But I got through a match between The Rock and Stone Cold at WrestleMania. That's good. I just good. went through a, you know, a quick little match to see if I could do anything with it. And dude, that's good. I mean, I think they've tried. I think that they've tried to do something, but it's still not worth any kind of real money. Like ten dollars, maybe. Well, and and here's the ones that like that, and then there's ones that I think work pretty well and have only gotten better over time. Uh, Doom, uh, Doom, and Doom Eternal on Switch actually are more than playable. They actually are pretty good. Um, but Dead by Daylight was fun. Dead by Daylight on Switch, you know, mm -hmm. you and Nikki, and the fact that they can do cross-platform and all that is still. <laughs> Dude, it was so. Y'all were playing on PC. Yeah, and uh, you... I was playing on the Switch, and I was just like, I think we had someone else who's playing on PlayStation as well. Something I think. like that. Yeah. yeah. So, but but that was so much fun. <clears throat> And also That's hearing funny. Nikki just like panic, just like when she's like, ah! <laughs> she's so funny. Oh, she's scary games or games that aren't scary. Just well, oh dude, scary. just like just like the uh, when we did Human Fall Flat. Yeah. I remember she was like, I'm the only one who hasn't died. I'm just like, okay, let's fix that. And I drag her off the side. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no! <laughs> God, we need to get back to that. We need yeah. to we need to open up those Pokemon card packs up there, and we need yeah. to get back to playing Human Fall Flat. We do because I have I've counted it, 214 packs of Pokemon cards yeah. up there. We need to get to those. Yeah, we do. And also, uh, we need to get to this video here. So uh, hey, hide video. it back around. Yeah, indeed. You know how we roll, man. So this is Game Boy when Boy Met Game by Scott the Waz. Here we go. Hey y'all, Scott here. Hi I Scott. I decided to start playing game systems with names that perfectly describe me. So, I'm gonna start playing the Microvision. <laughs> What's shaped like a brick and gives oh. you hours of fun? It's a close second. The Nintendo yeah. Game Boy. That's right, it's a minor. Easily one of the most important systems in gaming history. And for Easily, good reason. Yeah. There's some truth to why old people call anything that beeps a Game Boy. They worry me. But every time you see a portable video game device in a cartoon or something, it's almost always modeled after the original Game Boy. Two buttons, a D-pad, cartridge slot. This thing is so portable game system. And even though I never officially owned one before my virgin phase, it doesn't feel like oh. it. The original Game Boy launched a line of systems that lasted over 20 years. Most models being compatible with the games from that first one. I remember bringing yeah. my Game Boy Advance to kindergarten, to which most 80 year olds would say, that makes me feel old. The other kids and I would swap games around and try them out on our own systems. And I saw some of them having these weird gray cartridges. I was only used to the Game Boy Color and Advance ones. Then one of the kids whipped out their Game Boy. It was yes, the original. And even back one. then, I thought, oh, we got a super. Yeah. I remember you showing me that one. Mm -hmm. You still got, got the, the red. I had a brick, you know, original brick gray one. That thing, I had it for so long, and then I gave it to my cousin Josh. He, you know, he basically, I, I mean, basically his parents sold off all of his uh, gaming stuff whenever he got bad grades one year, and I got his PlayStation with like 10 games for dirt cheap. My dad, my dad managed to get that for me mm -hmm. one year for, it was, a, I think it was two years after the PlayStation launched, but I remember, like, he was so sad because he didn't have any games to play, and I was just like, I, I was like, I, I've got my Game Boy Color here, I don't need this Game Boy. Yeah. And I was like, hey Josh, here you go. And he was just like, he just gave me a big hug. Cause, I know that feeling. Cause, and then he was able to play his Game Boy games again, and he was so happy. But dude, you had to do something to these things to keep keep them down. They were like the Motorola tel cell phones. The, yeah. Um, dude, they, there was one that survived being blown up yeah. in the war in Iraq, and it is now on display in Nintendo's headquarters. Still works yeah. to this day. They click it on and, bring. Yeah, I saw one that had been left next to the eye of a stove, and like, 
the side of it melted into the screen and you could still put a game in it and turn it on and like half of the screen you could see the game going damn yeah like the whole side like the the whole shit on the left was completely burnt and like melted it's impossible to to kill these things half the time there's actually a guy who rebuilds and redoes like old game systems like Mm -hmm. he got one of these that i think someone had put something hot against the screen and the screen was basically dead yeah so basically all he did was he undid it he he cleaned everything out he deoxidized the plastic made it look like brand new got a dot matrix screen and put it in beautiful it yeah. worked it worked perfect it's neat but the fact that all he had to do is just replace the screen and it worked again shit used to be made solid i know we're sounding like those old fucks now but oh it's no true. here's the thing though <laughs> This is bore out through evidence. Yeah. I mean, this, it's been it's been this way since the days of old. Hell, Edison and the Commission, who de- decided you know how electricity was going to work in the United States, they had a light bulb that lasted forever, literally. Really? And and then Edison and them were just like, no, we need to sell more light bulbs. We need to purposefully make light bulbs that, that out. will burn out <clears throat> and will and the filament will literally pop on them and, and literally it, it, veritasium has a great video on this dude i recommend anyone check it out it is amazing and it shows how how people who control everything how monopolization is the enemy of innovation the, and, D, the ds is perfect no those games last forever too so. <laughs> <laughs> i would say i would say certain versions of the 3ds yeah. the dsi dude the dsi <clears throat> i think feels like a plastic toy that can break yeah but the original DS, that thing's a tank. Yeah, it is. See what happens when we put a newer game in there. This is amazing! No matter what era of Game Boy you grew up with, you Love still sort of feel that attachment towards mm-hmm. the others. It's all Game Boy at the end of the day. Ever since, I've always had a huge interest in that first era of Game Boy. I loved my Game Boy Color and Advance games, but I wanted to see what it was like one generation earlier. And now that I waste my time, I can finally use the original Game Boy and see what it's like. It f***ing stinks. The Game Boy was created in response to the booming success of Nintendo's home console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and the limitations of their LCD games, the Game & Watch series. The NES gave you long-lasting experiences, each on their own cartridges, some of which were high-score-based games straight out of the arcade, but many were taking gaming to the next level. Rich stories, new worlds you want to explore, definitive endings, just like a divorce. The Game & Watch games were a line of handhelds that contained one Damn, game on each, Scott. using an LCD display like a calculator. These pretty much had to be arcade style games. Just see how long you can last, try to win, like a divorce. Now handheld game systems Damn with it. cartridges weren't anything new, but they weren't anything good. Mostly dumb, simple, high score based games. A few of them were kind of fun, but most of these, they mainly just gave your thumbs a job. So what if we took how rich and deep the games on NES can be and shrunk them down to fit in a mouse? That was what Gunpei Yokoi was yep. born to do. The designer of numerous Nintendo the toys, father of the game and Cataracts, boy. went in and created a portable game system using interchangeable cartridges and a dot matrix screen. That sounds more impressive than it is. It's a manually operated fiber divider. The project was codenamed after the screen, Dot Matrix Game, or DMG, and didn't have a final name until Shigesato Itoi suggested the name Game Boy. This thing was developed with durability, longevity, and budgetary constraints in mind. Launching it. You want to know how Gunpei Yokoi came up with the, the idea to do the Game Boy? It's actually one of the most interesting things ever. In terms of like this, like studying <clears throat> humanity. So he was sitting on the toilet, right? Oh. And then like he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this paper, but I don't have any toilet paper. I'm gonna have to wipe my ass with this. So he had to just grit down, wipe his ass with the paper, and then he sat there and he was like, man, if I had like a portable gaming system that I could change out the games in right now. Yeah. Yeah. I it. I wish that were the case. That'd probably be a little bit more interesting than what I'm about to tell you. He was, this was, it was back in 1979. He was sitting on a train and he, he was working for Nintendo at the time. And I think he was a, uh, you know, he was just like a board designer back then. Mm-hmm. Um, he was sitting on the train and he noticed, like, he looked around at people, saw people reading newspapers, saw kids like playing with toys. And then he saw this businessman, this guy in a nice suit. And the guy didn't have a paper or anything like that. He saw him just like get all antsy and everything is, you know, started tapping his feet. Then he pulled out his calculator and just started fiddling around on his calculator for no reason. And then Yokoi was just like, hmm, if we could have something that they could play in their spare time, something pocket-sized like a calculator, because calculators are literally you push numbers and they appear on screen, 
What if we have something that you push buttons and things appear on screen, but we can control where it goes? And thus he invented the D-pad. Things can go up and down, left and right. And then the buttons on the side. And then that's when he came up with the Game & Watch series. Mm -hmm. And the Game & Watch series eventually evolved into this. And again, Gunpei Yokoi just hit home run after home run after home run. And then he basically, like, almost kneecapped his entire career when he came up with the Virtual Boy. <laughs> But in terms of him leaving Nintendo, he invented the Game Boy Pocket as like a farewell. And then... But the Virtual Boy, in essence, was an attempt at the Oculus Rift way before the technology Oh, it was, was before available. it was ready, dude. Before you know what it was I'm Well... So, yeah, it may have been like a failure, you know, as far as the marketing side of it and, and the sales side of it then, but as far as the innovation and the vision... He's oh no! Much on I, point. Well, I I will always say Gunpei Yokoi is one of the the fathers of modern gaming because did he do the glove? Was he the power glove guy? No, no, it was it wasn't him who okay. did that. I he his main thing was handhelds. He did like uh, he had designed some stuff for like Wonder Swan and all that, which was like these uh, learning games in Japan that were LCD screen things, and then Nintendo. Can, you know, Nintendo brought him in, and you know he gave them Game and Watch and gave them the Game Boy. And uh, the sad thing about Gunpei Yokoi was after he designed the Game Boy Pocket, he assisted in the development of the Game Boy Color. And in the midst of him assisting in the development of the Game Boy Color, uh, him and his friend broke down on the side of the road in Japan, or on this highway in Japan. And Gunpei Yokoi got out of the car to, you know, go uh, down the road and get help. And he was hit and killed. Damn. And it, and I. I was just like, oh, dude, if I could ever meet Gunpei Yokoi, and he was dead before I even knew he existed. Yeah. That's the that's the cra that's the crazy thing about these things. Their last ability, it makes you just want to be like, I'd love to meet Shigeru Miyamoto. Yeah. I would love to pick his brain and just be like, oh, dude, Miyamoto's on. You are so freaking amazing. And of course, I'd like to meet uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki from mm -hmm. uh, from Software. And it's just these people have all this impact on us. It's like Koji Kondo. People didn't know who the hell Koji Kondo was, but yet Super Mario Brothers theme, Legend of Zelda theme, uh, so many themes from Nintendo that he's composed, and you know he just did it because it was a hobby. He's just sitting back, yeah, posting. exactly. And these people have had such an impact on our lives, and it's it's sad when you know you don't get a chance to meet them or really get a chance to thank them for all that they've given you in life. But you know just the fact that we're sitting here talking about them and remembering them this way. I think is I think is pretty pretty freaking cool in its own right. Yeah. Anyway, back to this. And only eighty nine ninety nine on July thirty first, nineteen eighty nine here in North America. Oh no, I was April born when this came out. I thought it came out in eighty seven. In September twenty eighth, nineteen ninety in Europe. Nintendo has almost always been about fun on a budget, and nowhere was that more obvious than with the Game Boy. Look at this box. The future is here, f***er, and it's called 1989. This looks incredible. And then you play it. Really funny stand-up routine. There it is. Yeah, Even dude. when Nintendo was being more realistic with their images, like on the back of the box here, this screen still looks leagues better than what we actually get. A dot True. matrix display. What does that mean? It means let's get the hell out of here. Well, I guess if the Game & Watch has a display like a basic calculator, the Game Boy has a display like a more advanced calculator. Mm. And that can display more than just variations of the letter O. I mean, it still displays any old spray you could ask for here. It definitely can be used to play video games from this era. It just so happens to be ass green. Thank God I'm colorblind. The screen here is the Game Boy's biggest flaw. Not only is it not lit in any way, shape, or form, but it's not just black and white, it's black and puke. They used a green display with no colors because it helped the non-color visuals pop out the best at a low cost. Or they just thought it'd be funny. This is easily one of the most notorious mm. elements of the original model. You can't use it. You have a contrast dial which helps us see in numerous different lighting conditions, but for playing at dark, have an open mouth. We got the volume slider, headphone jack, and speakers for stereo sound, an extension port for accessories on an off switch, a port for an AC adapter, a battery compartment begging for four double A's, eight A's for just one device, and a full suite of buttons, the exact same buttons you'll find on an NES controller. They were obviously cutting corners a lot, but Nintendo ensured you would get as close and to a Diddy console or Diddy as possible Kong. with this That's thing. Of course, other stuff. companies responded, and mm -hmm. they responded Big. Just bring the damn TV oh. with you at this point. Competition towards the Game Boy quickly emerged. Ah, uh, yeah. Atari and Sega had full-color displays that were, in fact, lit up. These systems were more powerful, and I think people bought them out of fear of being crushed. All signs pointed to these things wiping the floor with the Game Boy. 
but Nintendo had a few aces up their sleeve. The initial price point was significantly cheaper due to the Game Boy's cost efficiency. Not using a color display will do that to you. They're all about saving money. I'm sure Nintendo employees eat cereal with water. Due to using cheaper Ow. technology, the Game Boy was not only more portable than the competition, its battery life was actually tolerable. I can't remember the last time I put batteries in this thing. It's just been run off the same ones for years. It can withstand 15 hours of continuous play on four double A's. Sega's Game Gear and Atari's Lynx contributed to the battery life movement we're dealing with today. I think yeah. <laughs> Yes, they did. Holy crap, did they? But, okay, here's an interesting thing about the uh, about the Game Boy series. Uh, Keith, uh, one of uh, Jacob's friends, I went over to his house and he showed me his original SP. He says, I have had this thing in this vault uh, where he keeps like his like top line stuff. I've had it in this vault for the better part of a decade, like eight or nine years. No one, be no one believes me when I say I haven't charged this thing. But ding, still starts up. And he showed me, he showed me. He's just like, like I don't have a charger for this thing. I lost the charger in a move. I've literally just had it sitting in here, and it still starts up, and it shows me it still has battery. I'm like. And he's like, how? How is this possible? And I'm like, quality, dude. Insanity. Quality. Quality speaks. And whenever people don't have to pay a premium for a big fuck-all stack of batteries like this to play their gaming system, I mean, dude, that's, yeah. that's a world. The other ones would even die plugged into the wall. Dude, yeah, that's <laughs> right. They would die plugged into the yeah. wall. Yeah. I remember the uh, oh my game here was just notorious for you'd be plugged in right in the middle of some shit. Oh. What the? Then you have to restart all the way over again. I remember that. Unless Sonic the Hedgehog 2, I was on like World 4, and it's the farthest I'd ever been. Unless you had like the code. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which I did eventually start writing those down, but still, dude design was far more appealing to everybody. These things honestly both look the exact same. The Game Boy was unique and it feels great to play. It may be bulky by today's standards, but you can still fit it in a pocket. All the buttons, the D-pad, they feel fantastic. Like I, actual console controllers. Handhelds usually have the audacity to include small clicky buttons to fit on a slimmer, tinier device compared to home console controllers. The Game Boy has these big meaty buttons that just feel right. They Me. feel substantial and none of Nintendo's future portables really replicated this feeling. It's a little awkward, obviously not the best it could possibly be, but it's well designed for 1989 and at its price point, it accomplishes what it set out to do and while that definitely added to the reason the Game Boy absolutely drain the Lynx's blood for fun, the core reason it did so well was the games. Yes. Same name. The Game Boy launched with five games here in North America, with one being notoriously bundled in. Not Yakuman. Tetris was already a well-known PC game at the time, but the idea to bundle it in with the Game Boy, genius. Nintendo was considering to put the game Super Mario Land in with the package, but was told while that would help the Game Boy appeal to kids, packing in Tetris would help the Game Boy appeal to everybody. So, in North America, the Game Boy launched with a Tetris game cartridge, not only helping the system, but the Tetris brand as a whole. These two things go hand in hand. Neither one of them would be the great success they became if not for each other. Tetris on the Game Boy yes. continues to be one of the best versions of Tetris. I know what you may be saying. Scott, fucking Tetris is fucking Tetris. No, oh, man, grass was way better back then. Hear me out. It's crazy, oh, but God. not every version of Tetris gets Tetris. Things... I, you can't say that around, like, some of these Tetris heads. Some of them, like... The uh, mass, uh, the uh, the Tetris Master, uh, uh, I think I can't remember which one it is. Tetris Master, uh, Master Program Three, I think. Everyone out there says that is the best Tetris, and it's the only one they still use to this day to determine who a Tetris Grandmaster is. Really? Yeah. And there was actually I actually witnessed a guy, Kevin DDR, become the first American Grandmaster on Twitch. Really? Because everyone was talking about it. It's like, dude, you, dude, he's going for it. He's going for it. It's like, he's going for what? First American Grandmaster in Tetris. Everyone else has been in Japan. He will be the first. And he did it. Damn. I remember seeing that. I was just like, oh my gosh, he did it. And he was crying, dude, because he's just been like, it's been 10 years. 10 years of him perfecting it and getting it Damn. right. And he did. Yeah, he did it. I couldn't right. believe the controls it. Feel the core Tetris gameplay is altered ever so slightly, but if you want the most pure and perfect version of Tetris, it's on the Game Boy. The iconic theme is here. It all controls well. It works perfectly within the Game Boy's limitations. Like everything appears on screen just fine. It doesn't mess around with modes that are kind of cute, then you never play again. It knows what you want. You jump in, play Tetris, jump out. It's basic, 
but not to a fault. And that's what I like about this version. It's simple, but it's perfectly simple. This helped the Game Boy tremendously, but that doesn't mean there weren't other games aiding to its success. Right alongside the system's launch came Super Mario Land. I love that this cover one, dude. so modern one. looking for a Mario game released you, in 1980. Gunpei Yukoi actually uh, developed this one. The, the guy who'd made the Game Boy. Nine. Prior yeah. to this, Mario artwork was still in its peach fuzz era. This one feels right in line with official art for the series released today. Mm -hmm. Of course, Super Mario Brothers helped to catapult the NES into superstardom, really being a game everybody had to try for themselves. Truly a revolution, so it's fair to expect Super Mario Land to be the same. This game creeps me out. I love Super Mario Land, and I think most good people do. But I think it's mostly because of how charming the game is with how primitive and simple it can be. It's a very basic and short Mario game. As a few elements unique to it. You don't get fireballs, you get super balls that bounce around. Turtles explode on impact. A few side-scrolling shooting stages, and we have our first title with a question mark in the middle. The physics are messed up here. If you're running, it doesn't really carry into your jump that well. You fall like a rock. Precise jumps are hard to make. But none of this really matters. Like I said, the game is just so damn charming. It's not difficult. It's super short. You can beat it in like 30 minutes, so it's like why complain about it? Is being critical about Super Mario Land going to change the world? Why does it matter that it doesn't control perfectly? It met the requirements of being Super Mario Brothers on a portable system, and that was a big deal. It still feels like Mario, and you could take it wherever you wanted. Sure, the screen of the Game Boy gets really blurry when there's a lot of movement. It can be hard to see enemies coming at you when you're running, but it's still playable. It's charming as all hell, and I still love going back to it over and over again. The game is simple, yet still Mario. The problems with the game are more so fun little quirks rather than deal breakers due to how short and easy the game is. I adore this game. Critically, you can tear it apart, but I feel like most people can see right past the flaws and enjoy this game for what it was back in 1989. The other launch titles were more so just the bare minimum of what Nintendo thought a game console needed at the time. Baseball and Tennis, pretty much the same as the Baseball and Tennis games for the NES. Stay away. And there was Alleyway, just a basic breakout clone. You're Still good, you're good. Though, which is the opinion I have for most of these Game Boy games. Mobile, yes, like, I mean, you know, there were some good ones. No, there were good sports games. The ones put but out on Nintendo? Not really. No, it, it was usually... Oh, gosh. No. Yeah. It, there were a few here and there, but it wasn't until the days of, like, Mario Tennis and Mario Golf yeah. where they really hit their stride and it was just like, you know what? There's only one way that we can solve the puzzle of making sports games with Mario in it. We don't make them ourselves. We make we depend on another company to make them, which that's what they've done every time. Yeah. They've always given passed it off to someone else. And now that they've absorbed that company, now it's considered first party, even though officially it's not really. Looking at them with a modern lens, they're all bitch simple. But being portable sorry, games in the late 80s, simple. I find them to be more interesting than many home console counterparts they had. Like, I would so much game. rather play baseball or tennis on Game Boy than NES, and that may be because Nintendo's re-released their NES games far more often than their Game Boy ones, but I find these more endearing. The NES is more capable than this. The Game Boy? I'll take what I can get. Overall, not a bad launch lineup. Two of the most iconic games on the entire platform, one of them packed in, a fun breakout game, and two sports titles if you want to get laid. The original Game Boy model wasn't the hottest looker, though. I this saw... Thing, I think Scott made an, made an error with his editing there. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's okay. I The amount of times I've had errors during editing. Yeah. I mean, it's just... Looks it's like impossible. It would just taste awful. So eventually, six years later, Nintendo released a line of Game Boys under the slogan "Play It Loud." The Def revolted. These were the exact same systems from '89, but now there were so many different color options. This is during Nintendo's rambunctious phase, trying to be cool for all the '90s kids. Yeah, stick it to the man. Buy a yellow Game Boy. These are pretty nice additions to the lineup, but this was six years after the launch. The Game Boy lasted so long, and for a giant chunk of its lifespan. It was still just that old brick. The next year, in 1996, Nintendo finally released a revision titled The Game yeah. Boy Pocket. And the most tolerable handheld goes to... This? It is a fraction of the size. Comes in a variety of colors. Only costs $69.99. The screen is bigger, clearer. Yeah, doesn't get as blurry during motion sequences. Doesn't look fucking disgusting. Only uses two AAA batteries instead of four AA's. This is a huge improvement, though I do still think the original has more character. Just look at the fonts for the buns. This looks like a PowerPoint presentation. Get out Plus, of here. I don't think it's as comfortable as the 89 model. I don't like it when my hands on the back touch. Keep these things away from each other. But the pocket helped rejuvenate the Game Boy, giving it a much needed modern makeup. Also, I don't know if you're noticing this, 
but things away from each other. But the but every time he moves the Game Boy, like flips it left and right. Look at the uh, the directional pad. Pocket mm. helped rejuvenate Bonk. the Game Boy, Bonk. giving it a much needed <laughs> modern Bonk. makeover. It was still incredibly affordable, and, keep, and at this just... point had a treasure trove of games in its catalog. Plus, most of the problems with the original were made much better now. But one thing still needed fixed. Two the years backlight. later, in 1998, only in Japan, Nintendo released the final revision. Only the in game Japan. Boy what? Line. One of the biggest yes. issues with the Game Boy line you was the lack of any fuckers. light on the screen. You just straight. Yep, I know, right? You fucking fuckers! <laughs> I remember hearing about this. And we I was even just like, had to have a light for the Game Boy. I remember Play, that. Just like, pop it in on the side and that no, drained the battery even more. Wait a minute. Wasn't it until the Game Boy Advanced SP that, that we, we got didn't backlight? get an official backlight? Yeah. You sons of bitches. I man. know. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm legitimately fucking Ooh. pissed off. I right know. <laughs> I had no idea that there was. A, a I, legitimate backlit system. You didn't know about the Game Boy Light? No. Bro, it's one of like the it's at first it was considered a rumor back in the day. Like everyone was just like, oh dude, it's not real. It's not real. I never and, even heard a whisper of and it. And then all of a sudden I heard I I heard of an article, a uh, Nintendo Power of Japan, uh someone posted it somewhere online from like back it from like oh god, this is like back in two thousand two, two thousand three. Yeah on the old forums and they posted an image of the of the Game Boy Light and everyone was just like fake 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 no it was real yeah it was as real as it gets yeah well you know what fuck them i'm angry i'm angry about it we'll have this. to get you one for christmas i don't know man i don't even know if i would want one of these things it's i've lived a lie for so long now you know and hey it's okay we all we all have revelations. God damn it. I know. Straight up couldn't see it without some kind of light source. The Game Boy Light, however, popped a backlight into the display, which you can turn on and off. Without the light, this thing lasts 20 hours on two double A's, which is amazing. And then with the light on, it lasts for 12 hours, which is still very respectable. The yes. handheld is very similar to the Game Boy Pocket in terms of design, but a bit larger, which makes it more comfortable. The backlight is pretty much just here so you can play in the dark. It doesn't make the screen more viewable in good lighting conditions. In fact, half the time I can't even tell it's on. It makes the handheld playable at night, that's pretty much all it does. You know, I was hoping it was going to give me advice. Which is a problem deal, is, especially... Yeah. Oh, and then there's the color. This revision released a mere months before Nintendo released the full upgrade, the Game Boy Color. Featuring a color screen and exclusive games, it was pointless to buy this, even if it had the backlight and the color didn't. Since these released so close to each other, it's understandable why this never left Japan. Also, America hates vision. It didn't make sense to make consumers decide between a light and a color when it was obvious the color was what Nintendo really wanted to sell here. The yeah. original Game Boy wasn't discontinued we'll put the until light on the color. 2003, living an incredible 14 You're asking years, too much. it really lived on for far longer than that. The Game Boy Color and Advance were compatible with these old games, with the Advance being discontinued in 2010. The Game Boy line was so popular, with the original first three models selling 64 million plus units before the Colors release in 98. And all of that can be attributed to the great games release for this thing. Like Bach and Chase and Mortal Kombat 2. I have a soft spot for the Game Boy library, but even the best games are often gimped in some ways, though every Game Boy game I've played I can always appreciate them, far more than a lot of other games from this era. It is so charming to go back to when this was portable gaming. It's fun to see where concessions were made and they aren't too egregious considering you're, you're playing it on this. Okay, what were you expecting? These cartridges are adorable. They're like NES cartridges you can choke on more easily. And the NES is the best console to compare to the Game Boy, as most of these titles feel like black and white NES games. The Game Boy definitely isn't as capable as the NES in many ways, so games sometimes don't run as smoothly as they do on there. But again, taking the era in which this was released into consideration, you're getting a fairly comparable experience on the go. The problem is, the Super Nintendo was right around the corner and was the primary system during the Game Boy's life. So while the Game Boy can do NES-style games quite well, 
bringing Super Nintendo-like games over cracks me up. We can see that with the sequel to Super Mario Land, released three years later, Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins. You collect coins all the time, who cares? Mario Land 1 was a solid portable take on the Mario formula, though it was kind of in the camp of good enough. That game on any hardware other than the Game Boy would be executed. Mario Land 2, well, that's actually just a flat-out great game, regardless of it being on the Game Boy or not. Definitely feels more like Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo, for better or for worse. The game does struggle with how big and chunky the sprites are. I mean, the original Mario Land, I was worried the sprites were my spittle on the screen. Here, everything is big and bold and I love it, but we can a lot more slow down because of that. Mario Land 2 does struggle a bit with being a full-size Mario game on the handheld, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the best Game Boy games. I'm not sure I'd consider it to be one of my favorite Mario games. Oh yeah, Mario Jason games. Masks. Kind of yeah. The infamous Jason Masks uh, Goombas. Those things, those things scared me a little bit yeah. when I was younger. I was like... I mean, there's a fucking sword sticking out of his head. Yeah. Jesus. And look at those black that black eyes with the white pupils staring Fucking at you. Fuel. Just be just being like I'm going to murder you with and your entire face. family and I'm going to stump you with Wait, my little feet. He's got like plunger legs. Yeah. He does. <laughs> feel like it's made cooler just because it's a Game Boy game. But it's a great title in its own right and deserves more recognition. It was the debut of Wario, I can't say that about myself. But they ended up <laughs> taking him from this game and making him the whole focus of the third Mario Land, Wario mm -hmm. Land Super Mario Land 3. Can't wait for Max Payne's Super Mario Land 4. I always forget there were three Mario Lands, but it's completely fair considering the third game is an inbred take on a third game. Super <sighs> Mario Land 3 isn't a Mario Land game, much like how Super Mario World 2 isn't a Mario World game. They both take yes. characters from the previous entries and give them their own spin-off series. They just had to give them a Mario subtitle to really sell it to you. Sure. Wario Land is <laughs> wow. a game starring Ogre, Mario Dude, Mario Ogre Battle is a great game. Come on. Platformers, including Wario Land 2 on the original Game Boy as well. What makes Wario Land work is how it really throws you a curveball. You head into it expecting a Mario game, but you get off-key music and mechanics that make these games truly their own thing. There aren't a ton of Mario spin-offs on here. NES games like Yoshi, Yoshi's Cookie, and Dr. Mario got Game Boy versions. Dr. Mario is a weird one considering it's all about matching colors. Who did they f to make this ah. work. There was one oh. Mario spin-off that was the Game Boy Zone, though. Something uh. fresh, something new, something definitively Mario. Mario's Picross. Because the Ted Dance and deal fell through. Picross is a puzzle game, kind of like mixing crossword puzzles with Sudoku. Each row and column has a number, and that denotes how many squares are shaded in. So you compare each and figure out where exactly to chip away, and we have art. This game has almost nothing to do with Mario outside of the menus and a few puzzles, but it doesn't stop me from loving this game to bits. It's such a fun and addictive puzzle game, and most critics say that too. It sold like ass. At least we have Donkey Kong. That's the full name. Most people call it Donkey Kong 94 based on the year it was released. In a sentence, it's great. In a longer sentence, it's really great. I mean, this is a Game Boy game, a continuation of the arcade title. We all asked, what happens next? Another whole ass game! A puzzle platformer made specifically for the Game Boy. This isn't like Mario Land 2, where that's an amazing game that does sort of struggle with the limitations of the handheld. This was made with everything in mind. It is, in my opinion, the perfect Game Boy game. And they followed it up with a nightmare. The Donkey Kong Land series. Three games, all meant to be supplemental titles to the three Donkey Kong countries on Super Nintendo. You have to admit, these are impressive on the system, and they are their own games. They take heavily from their home console counterparts, but these are unique level designs. It's just, my god, these don't work on this thing. The sprites are so detailed, which is impressive, but it makes the game nearly unintelligible. That's a problem with many Game Boy titles. They didn't take the screen's quality into consideration. Uh. I will say, it's I not. Mean, I played it. I didn't have problems with it. Yeah. I didn't have many problems with it. As bad as you think it'd be, but you just can't make out what's on here sometimes. I mean, these are just the novelty to go back to today. Even back then, they were like, wow, it's Donkey Kong Country on the go. Now it's like, wow, they sold this. Donkey Kong 94 is definitely the one to go for. These are neat from a historical point of view, but just play the Super Nintendo games like Jesus. That was the biggest issue with Game Boy games, when they tried to be far more than what they could be. Like, stop it, man, you're gonna hurt yourself. If the Game Boy released a few years earlier, we wouldn't have had this issue as much, but because it was thriving during the reign of the Super Nintendo, Nintendo wanted to put Super Nintendo quality games on here, so we got games that tried to stand toe-in-toe -to -toe with what was on consoles at the time. Case in point, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. This is a full-blown Legend of Zelda game. It's pretty much the same length as Link to the Past on Super Nintendo. Yes. Nothing's compromised. If anything, Link's Awakening takes the core of Link to the Past and makes it work on a Game Boy. It's pretty crazy. Playing yeah. on an yeah. actual Game Boy model, though, this is rough. I have no idea. On the color, it was much better. Yeah. I played it on the Game Boy, on both. This and the Game Boy Color. 
Gotta say, the Game Boy Color version is amazing. Yeah, how anybody did this. I mean, at least with the pocket, maybe. But I can't imagine playing this compared to the re-release they did for the Game Boy Color. Yeah, that oh one. That's God. the one I played. The game also feels very shoehorned onto the platform. You have to switch between different items all the time in this game. Like, constantly. Which forces you to go into the menu, swap out items, go back, swap them out again. It feels like if they made this game from the ground up for the Game Boy, they'd take the lack of buttons into consideration and not design a game around using all these items and having to swap between them over and over again. With that being said, Link's Awakening is a lovely <clears throat> game. It has so much charm being the first mainline portable Zelda adventure. They did some weird things with this one, including tons of cameos from other Nintendo properties. This is obviously a stone-cold classic. The only problem is the system it was made for. When it got a full remake in 2019, it showed how much of this game at its core was already perfect. They only really changed things that were there due to the limitations of the Game Boy console, like the whole item swapping debacle. Other than that, it's the exact same game, and that speaks volumes of the original Link's Awakening's quality. This wasn't a completely watered down, portable throwaway game. This was the real deal, and Nintendo's had that mentality with all of their handheld systems, which is why I think they've always succeeded. Whenever Sega or Sony would put out games on their portables, they were always the lesser versions. Who cares about that Uncharted? It's just a side story. Hey! Nintendo Golden Abyss is a great game, bro. I made a Zelda game for the Game Boy. I played that it one to completion. The next big Zelda a game. When Nintendo made a Metroid game for the Game Boy. It. it was a mistake. What am I doing? Metroid 2 Return of Samus. A fair attempt at a Metroid game on the platform. To be honest, Metroid during this time period was a bit too cryptic and obtuse for my Donkey Kong 94 brain. These games are so <laughs> difficult to do anything in without a map. You have to draw one out yourself. In 1991, sure. In 1994, go yourself. Well, Kid Icarus got a sequel on the Game Boy 2, Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, strangely a game that never released in Japan and was the only other Kid Icarus game until 2012 with Kid Icarus Uprising. This is basically more of the same from the NES game, but again, that's impressive and exactly what customers wanted. If you were buying Kid Icarus on the Game Boy, it was because you wanted Kid Icarus on the go, not a card game spin-off, Sony. That doesn't yeah, mean that companies that didn't put the beat like. teams on the Game Boy versions. We got a whole heap of third-party home console conversions, like five Mega Man games. Some Castlevanias, Contras, a bunch of Final Fantasies that weren't actually Final Fantasy. They were random RPGs Square brought over to North America and called yeah. them Final Fantasy. These were all up in the air. Like, sometimes they can be good, and sometimes they're Castlevania the Adventure. I really have a love for the first Game Boy Mega Man game, Mega Man and Dr. Wily's Revenge. The Mega Man Game Boy games were like remixed, abridged versions of the NES ones, but sometimes they weren't just remixed, abridged versions, they were bad. Even then, I still look fondly upon all these games, even if they weren't that great. They give you fairly authentic, portable takes on these franchises. Franchises. Like Mega Man looks and plays like Mega Man. Same with Castlevania, Double Dragon. The only exception I'll make is this fighting game Street Fighter 2 Mortal Kombat Killer Instinct. Yeah. I feel really bad for the kids that said, Mom, that. Like, man, Mario's right over there! The fighting games felt more like things for your thumbs to do rather than actual engrossing video games to play. Oh, I mean, come on. Game, you better do, like, they're fighting games, go, bro. That's what they're meant for. But I just feel like you had way better options. Like, as handhelds progress, you can make an argument playing Super Street Fighter 4 on the 3DS helped you practice for playing the console version. No. There's not much to these versions. They're the fighting games on the Game Boy. A worthy attempt, but they just aren't what the Game Boy's good at. Like, puzzle games were the Game Boy's jam. Not only did we have Tetris, but Tetris 2. This isn't RPGs Tetris. Is. Tetris Blast! Who the f*** are you? Tetris Attack. I love you, but stop lying. Kix is great here. One of my favorite arcade games. A Taito classic published by Nintendo on the Game Boy. The Game Boy can handle this. Right? No matter how poor the hardware is, you're always gonna have somebody out there who wants to be a smartass. X was a Japan-only game published by Nintendo that laid the groundwork for Star Fox. 3D! In black and white! It's the future yesterday! Baseball 2000, a first-person shooter? Yeah, I mean, it's the Game Boy, you can do anything. I think Game & Watch Gallery helps show what the Game Boy was best at. These are remakes and ports of classic Game & Watch games, and it's a treat to have this era of Nintendo represented on the Game Boy, as it was its direct predecessor. Balloon Kid, a sequel to Balloon Fight? Perfect fit for this. Thing. Great for simple, addictive gameplay. Space Invaders? Yeah, sure, it's great. The Game Boy may have had a lot of well-known franchises continue on it, but it started a few key ones. Mole Mania debuted on the Game Boy. That's something you hear every day. We get it. This is an obscure <laughs> Nintendo-developed game. It's produced by Shigeru Miyamoto, and it's a fun puzzle game. You go between the top layer and bottom layer of each stage to get to the end. It feels like something that should have seen more success, but Nintendo realized kids hate moles. 
Fuck you! Wave, Wave Race started on the Game Boy. Yeah, Wave, Wave Race 64. Race, That's a sequel to a Game Boy game just called I Wave Race. It. I never hear anybody Damn. talk about this. And honestly, for the longest time, I just thought Wave Race 64 was the first Wave Race. They just put 64 on the title because it's 64. Nintendo. They're crazy. They made a game about moles, okay? But shockingly more important was the conception Kirby's of a white dream. guy. Kirby's Dream Land. <laughs> Kirby originally was white. Fox Art Illustrator yeah. didn't know he was it wasn't to until later well, they made him pink. The, the original Kirby's Dream Land was designed around being a beginner's game. It's stupid easy and short, but that's what it was always meant to be. Kirby's supposed to be a shut your brain off kind of game, and Dream Land is a fun one to blast through sometimes. This was followed up with an NES sequel, Kirby's Adventure, but back on the Game Boy, we got Dream Land 2, which was definitely a huge upgrade, but even back then, Nintendo milked the hell out of Kirby. Pinball Land, Block Ball, Star Stacker, Kirby got so many spin-offs on the Game Boy, it's ridiculous. It's probably because Kirby was the perfect choice for the face of that original brick. All of his games were simple, easy to pick up, and worked on the system well. Putting him in a pinball game, a breakout clone, a puzzle game, it all made sense. Kirby fits everywhere. Put him in Florida, I don't care. Well, those are the most oh, iconic God. titles on the game. Oh, The Simpsons. Hundreds of garbage whatever games, but even the worst games, honestly, I still have a weird appreciation for them on this thing. The bad games are way more tolerable on the Game Boy, and I feel like it's because I look at everything here and appreciate it all due to the limitations. Rummaging through a crate full of old, gray Game Boy cartridges, there's something magical about it. No matter how good or bad the game is, I just find original Game Boy games to have this undeniable charm about them. Being in black and white and on a system you have to hold up to a light to be able to play, it's weirdly endearing. And just the fact Nintendo supported the system with so many accessories shows other people agree. I mean, come on. The Game Boy camera? That's so stupid, I love it. At one point, this held the world record for smallest digital camera. Doesn't mean it's good, you can't hold me accountable for saying that. You can hook this up to the Game Boy printer to print off your pictures, it lets you press a few other games and uses receipt paper. That way, it doesn't require ink cartridges, just a specific roll of paper, which is such a Nintendo decision to make. The Super Game Boy allows you to play these games on a Super Nintendo on a TV, which made for the ability to actually enjoy some of these titles. We got screen lights and magnifiers, which just made things worse. Battery packs, the link cable, connecting your Game Boy to another one for multiplayer action. God damn it. Pokemon is the biggest media franchise of Thank all you. Time. I've been Even waiting. The original Game Boy, it helped keep the handheld alive for so long, releasing late in its life. It's an RPG series about collecting and battling monsters called Pokemon, and it spawned countless sequels, spin-offs, movies, music, merchandise. It's hard to think where Nintendo would be in the portable market today without Pokemon. Okay, I said it. <laughs> Dude. I was waiting. I was about to just go in, son, because I saw, and he, he set it up, too. When he was sifting through the games, there was the silver version. Yeah. Didn't mention it. At that point, I was like, I know that you hate RPGs, you cocksucker, but you better fucking bring up the fact <laughs> that that game absolutely dominated and, and launched it destroyed. Game Boy. It destroyed everything yeah. in its way, man. They, they didn't have to even come out with another game and they would have sold the Game Boy. Oh, yeah. Period. <clears throat> End of story. So, yes, Scott. Oh, maybe I should mention one of the greatest game franchises ever. No of all shit. Time. Maybe, maybe, maybe you fucking should, you little <laughs> joking bass. We've always been cool, Scott. Yeah. And you ain't never had no heat on nothing. But then you start coming off like a little smug asshole when you're talking <laughs> about... We're not talking about a game that has to now reach greatness. We're talking about a made game here. It yeah. has nothing to prove to you, you, you fucker. <laughs> All right. Woo! Okay. So, uh, hold on, hold on. Let me uh, sim simmer down there. Get the get the fire out of your lungs, man. Jesus. Well, I mean, let's be real, man. I know, I know, I know. But we love you, Scott. We really do. Just... <laughs> We know you're not an RPG guy. I love Pokemons more. That's fair. That's more than fair. I mean, I, I love Pokemon a lot. I mean, it's it's one of the biggest parts of my childhood. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But let's see what the... Uh, let me see something here. What was the... Uh, let me go ahead and... The numbers. What are the numbers for Pokemans? Oh, we gotta get the digits. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> A lot. Hmm. Here we go. 
video game series. Units sold of the original red and blue, 31 million. It's a lot. Gold and silver, 23 million. Ruby and sapphire, 16 million. Diamond and pearl, 17. Heart gold and soul silver, 12 million. Black and white, 15 million. I mean, Jesus, dude. And now sword and shield, over 22 million. I mean, say what you will. Insanity. Say what you will about these games. You know, oh, they don't innovate. Oh, they don't. You're right. In some ways, they don't innovate. Well, they are now. They, they're they're, they're innovating more and more. The big innovations. Let's hope, because I'm hoping here soon Even that... Even just the way it looks is well, huge. Brilliant, I know that Brilliant Diamond and <clears throat> Brilliant Pearl, uh, or Shining Pearl, these are, these are ones that a lot of people are excited about. Then Arceus. That's the one that's, I think, going to be the biggest jump for them, and it looks like it's going to be the craziest, um, you know, kind of like open Gameplay world change. experience that they've done. So pre-release world. Uh, so yeah, they're even saying here that it's supposed to be like Breath of the Wild. Yeah, and both in gameplay and in cinematic styles shown. Perceived lack of depth, inconsistent visual quality, and performance issues. Again, if it delivers on release date, awesome. But if it's gonna be like, if it's gonna be like other games that just are sharply disappointing, oh okay. But we'll see when we get there. We will see. Yeah, we'll see. But, okay. I think that's going to do it for this one. This was Scott the Waz, Game Boy, When Boy Met Game. Hopefully you all enjoyed. And uh, hopefully we will see you all in the next one. So I guess until then, I'm Nate. I'm Chad. We'll see you then, everybody. Peace out.